Have you ever sat and stared up at the stars and wondered, where did we come from? Let's take a journey like no other, not to a place, but to a time. Join us as we delve deep into the human past and explore our shared human origins. Welcome to the world of paleoanthropology. Everybody, this is Seth from the world of paleoanthropology, and today I am so utterly excited for this episode of the story of us because, as you know, with all of the news coming out of Rising Star from South Africa, there has just been a storm surrounding Homo Naledi, and today we have someone I think who really can answer all of our questions that we can at the time, and so I'm very happy to invite our next guest, who I will hand over the mic to to introduce himself. Well, thank you, Seth. It's great to be back. And I'm, of course, Lee Berger. I run the Rising Star Project. I'm an explorer in residence for National Geographic. I'm a professor of paleoanthropology at the University of Witwatersrand and a senior Carnegie Science Fellow from Washington, D.C. Absolutely amazing. And it's so great to have you. And I'm just so pleased to see you back on the show. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm in, by the way, in a freezing cold Johannesburg. <laughs> it actually snowed today. I saw that. You know, I was looking through, you know, all the social media today, getting ready, and I, I saw that it was snowing. I was, I was stunned. I mean, is that how often does that happen? <laughs> About once every decade, if that. <laughs> That's incredible. Must be a special day then. Um... <laughs> Cool. We started uh, we started working dragons back today, so the entire yes, team spent yes. the night in tents. So wow, it wasn't very special for them. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's funny. Yeah, I did see that you guys started again. So, and I do want to talk about that, and I'm sure that'll come into our discussion. Now, I don't want to cover the whole story today of what Homo Naledi is because I believe my viewership kind of knows, you know, the general story from 2013 and whatnot. But if you could, do you mind giving us a brief overview? And I've talked about it, but just from your point of view of these new discoveries that were announced in the last month. Right. So I think it, for those who aren't familiar with Homo Naledi, just the very quick elevator Absolutely. speech about them, which is a, a very small-brained, uh, generally primitive-looking in the way that we used to kind of define uh, uh, primitive members being more ancient members of the hominin lineage in its overall body plan, its bow plan, if you will, a prognathic face, a uh, dentition that has a sort of uh, primitive character to it, but very small, like a, in, in that sense, more derived, uh, very ape-like shoulders. It gets progressively more human-like as you uh, move towards it, the areas that contact the world, the, the fingertips. And, and as you move down the body, a primitive Australopithecine-like pelvis, if you will, uh, indicates some type of bipedalism, not quite human, on down to a very, very human-like foot. They're tall, uh, four and a half to five and a half foot tall on the specimens that we have. And we have a lot of them. They're probably one of the best represented certain species of hominid in the in the fossil record with uh, well over 30 individuals now um, that have been published. There's a lot more in the case. They come from a very unusual circumstance here in South Africa, a single cave system. It has about four kilometers of passages. Uh, and uh, they date to a surprising period. The dates that we have now um, uh, are between 230,000, 240,000, approximately, and 330,000 years. Uh, I will, we'll talk about later, I suspect those dates are going to widen. Uh, I, I know they're going to widen, uh, and we've alluded to that in the most recent papers. Um, they were thus a species that was out of time and place, given their morphology. That time period uh, was, until their announcement, thought to be in Africa. Uh, there was only thought to be in Africa Homo sapiens, um, either an archaic form, but really at that point transitioning to modern humans. And of course, paralleling that, an emergent archaeological record uh, indicating a greater complexity that we had always attributed to humans. Uh, and uh, that uh, we thought all of the archaeology was happening because of humans. I think it's fair to say, I, I know that I do, I, and 
this is controversial. I say homo nullius is not a human. I don't think it's a grade level of us. I don't think it's how we define a uh, human in the broadest sense. And therefore, it, it sits out of time and out of place. Uh, we hypothesized when we announced it back in 2015, uh, not only was it a new species, Homo naledi, we placed it in the genus Homo, uh, but but with some, you know, some debate over that or whether it should have been something else because of its primitive nature, but we thought its overall character leaned in that way, the way we defined Homo, at least at that time, and we suggested that they were deliberately disposing of their dead. Uh, that was very controversial uh, because people thought that that type of behavior, even as loosely translated as having put the bodies into uh, a deep space, deep within a cave over and over again, was was uh, it wasn't burial. It wasn't very complex mortuary practices. It, it seemed to approach that. And pretty much everyone thought that was the domain of large brained hominids. Uh, we then. Uh, have continued our work. It's a massively published species, dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, 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 scientific papers, peer-reviewed papers, and and other types of of outputs. It's one of the largest science projects in the world, with uh, well over 150 scientists now involved in it. And those numbers are growing all the time in all aspects of studying it. But we were always missing something, and what we were missing was Homo naledi's culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, because all we found in those uh, chambers where we were finding them, first the Dinaledi, then the Lissetti, then in other remote areas, were, uh, were Homo naledi bodies. That all changed over the last several years. Firstly, we began to see what we felt were features that had either one or more individuals in them that appeared to be holes that were carved into the floors. And those bodies were in there either... And what we were interpreting as uh, and have interpreted as uh, uh, flex positions and also with isolated remains in unusual places like the Letty skull, which is a very remote area, but it's only the face of, mm -hmm. of, a, a, of a young child in the Letty. And then last July, we, uh, while well, I made a journey into the cave, uh, into this chamber, which is very difficult to access, uh, I recognize that there were markings on the wall. Um, and given the remoteness of the place, the extreme nature of the event, and the fact that we were th by then interpreting burials directly beneath them, uh, we have come out recently with both the announcement that we believe we have met the standards for what we would define as human levels of the definition of burial, and that we had found meaning-making symbols. Symbols. At the same time, uh, I've announced in the Carnegie lecture last year, and we've shown images of that we are uncovering massive evidence of the utilization of fire throughout the cave system, and we are also attributing that to Homo naledi um, uh, in the absence of any evidence of Homo sapiens having been in there other than very recent explorers. That's Homo naledi in a nutshell. <laughs> and, you know, this is absolutely just ground shattering for the field i mean this i don't think anything like this has happened ever in the field i mean <laughs> obviously there's been discoveries that have reshaped how we feel and think about paleoanthropology and i'm not saying that homo naledi of course changes everything we know because i don't think there's one discovery that does but it really does change how we think and feel about our own past and you know a lot of research scientists have not agreed with the way that you have put out the information um some just think that you know it needed the peer review first what do you say to those people and why do you think that the open access was possibly more important than going the other route Okay, so firstly, and and by the way, our response to reviewers in the eLife thing and those first reviews are going to be published, I believe, on the twelfth. I think that's okay. uh, so you you'll get you'll get a lot of the written answers. This <laughs> uh, I I want to I want to clarify a few things though. Um, these papers, well, the barrel of paper specifically was in peer review in a top tier journal for eight months. Mm -hmm. um, it has been peer reviewed. Uh, we mm -hmm. answered those reviews. 
we could not come to a point where the journal, and it is one of the most prestigious journals in the world, could feel that they could publish the paper in a timely manner. So it's disingenuous for people to say they haven't been peer reviewed. They've been peer reviewed. And in fact, the reviews, by the way, were more positive than most of the reviews I've ever had in papers that have been published in that very same <laughs> journal. I'll just tell you that. Um, so we understood what the criticisms uh, were of that. Uh, the eLife model, it's uh, it's also disingenuous of people to say that that's not a peer review model. It's just a different one. That we know we are pioneers in a field in that journal, particularly we did the original Roman Letty mm -hmm. material in them, and we've, we've continued to publish in the most open access format as it is, has evolved itself. Um, the way that works is that when you submit, it goes before a panel of the papers go before a panel of editors. They decide whether that it will be published as a peer reviewed preprint. Mm -hmm. uh, but they insist upon that moment that it be pu published in a, a um, in a open access archive, uh, in this case, BioArchive X, and it comes out. Uh, and anyone who bothers to look at that would understand that that's the method. And most sciences, most real sciences today, and that is, you know, physics, uh, chemistry, biology, these type of things. And, and, and we certainly learned that over COVID, you know, that it, this is mm -hmm. not an uncommon way for hard sciences to publish. And so we're just part of a system of a, a new and yes, modern way of addressing the open access. What's cool about it is you're gonna to get to see that process unfold. You're gonna see uh, critical peer uh, reviews mm -hmm. appear. You're gonna to get to see how we as authors um, respond to that, how we deal with it, what we accept and what we uh, decline to accept and, and the arguments for and against those. Uh, as we move ahead, you'll also see our responses to those previous peer reviews because we are transparent about them um, in this. And so the difference is that you're going to, the audience, the public, and other colleagues are going to get to understand what the uh, thoughts of 37 scientists are against three or four peer reviewers. And I'm saying that very deliberately because you must remember that this is the product of a large number of researchers work. We don't do this idly. And I know the way the media works. And I know it often says Lee Berger says, uh, <laughs> this is a lot of scientists say, um, and, and putting the evidence out there. This is, as you rightly say, perhaps, you know, something that is one of the most controversial things that has been, um, you know, posited, hypothesized in this field of, of, of scientific endeavor in a very long time. It is the most radical. I mean, the Tong Chow was more radical than this <laughs> in, in many ways, and there have been other things. But, but it is radical largely because of our obsession with human exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and actually, I think that the response, uh, if you are fair about it, has been surprisingly not that critical. Um, Absolutely. The critics that have been vocal, really, it's about eight or nine of the same people over and over again in, <laughs> in different venues, which include some of the reviewers um, mm -hmm. th that we've been dealing with. So it's uh, it's uh, it, it's it. This is a process. It is a common scientific process that we are following. That is, in a large part, not in our hands. Uh, and that that we're dealing with. So when when you say why did you choose, we have just chosen to go through another modern peer review process. Uh, this one's just you're going to get to watch, and you're going to get to watch uh, how we do things. And I think that's exceptionally important. You know, I, as you know, Seth, and I have for for decades been a proponent of open access. I was an early starter into that, an early, uh, an early proponent of uh, opening access to not only the fossils themselves and the data behind it, which in, uh, in the past has been woefully hidden uh, by this particular field, but also the way we do this science. 
the way we do it from the moment of discovery to the moment of announcement and publication. I don't shy away from that. In fact, I'm unapologetic about that because I think it makes better signs. Paleoanthropology is not the Wizard of Oz. It's not a curtain where we're playing an organ behind. You should be able to see everything from the moment of discovery to our thought, thought processes, the measurements in the lab, and then you should be able to test them yourself. That's what you can do with this. You can measure every fossil. You can see everything. And we got criticism, as you know, for, well, you have to excavate the entire burials. Well, if we did that, then there's no evidence left. Mm -hmm. And every mm -hmm. single question that everyone has asked can only be answered by the data we chose to collect and how we chose to present it. I.e., You have to believe us. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's science. And I think you make so many great points in what you just said. And I, as anyone who watches the show, of course, knows I am such a believer and proponent of open access. I think it's one of the things that attracted me to your work so early on when I first got interested in the field. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, what you're trying to do here is you're not just saying like you said, believe us, here's what it is. You're saying, here's what we found. You're literally, you can look and see what we found yourself, especially when that Netflix documentary comes out. And that's, I believe the 17th, right? Yep, that's right. Monday. Okay, um, which it's great, by the way, for everyone. Um, I haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 great. It really is. Um, and everyone will be able to see these things for themselves. And then I think what you're doing is you're saying, here it is, do your own testing do your own work on it. We're making it so people can add to the collective knowledge of what we know and everyone can benefit from it. Not, I'm going to sit in this little tower and tell you what to think. You know, it's funny you touch on that. There's a couple of things which have emerged in, in some of the open criticisms. And, you know, by the way, science is a debate process. So, you mm -hmm. know, I, I am, the team and I are not, either afraid nor unencouraging about criticism. That's how we do better science. You know, we want to engage the entire intellectual way forward on these things. We have formulated a hypothesis that will be, or multiple hypotheses that will be tested and we will inform the way those are tested by ideas and discourse and debate that comes for I think is constructive but there were some interesting things that, that came about uh, that do surprise me um one of the criticisms that was very open and I think you'll see this in the reviews very clearly was we shouldn't have done things like we shouldn't publish the symbols because there's a chance mm -hmm. they could be made by by modern humans well right, I don't right. think that's true um I think that the the I think that's the height of human arrogance is my simple answer to that because there's no evidence of modern humans and <laughs> there are, there's only homo naledi there, but, but, and the second one was, well, we shouldn't publish the tool shaped rock um, because it's uh, you know, we can't be certain that that's a tool. I find that remarkable. Uh, and I think mm. you wouldn't find many fields other than archaeology and paleoanthropology, would say, which if if I say that in a different way, we don't think you should show all the evidence. Could you imagine <laughs> if we had published this and said, oh, by the, you know, we don't mention that those things right behind your head are on the wall above it, um, or that yeah. there's not a thing, which is the a shape of what has been called a lithic or tool in many middle stone age contexts is sitting practically if not in the hand of a homo naledi child in what we're interpreting as a burial i i cannot imagine how that would look both historically and how it would be viewed scientifically and so we we did we're not saying they are we're saying we hypothesize they are mm -hmm. and then if evidence comes up to show that difference, then we will reformulate those hypotheses. I personally don't think they will. I think that, you know, I think the, the the idea that humans went into that space, which is inaccessible practically to humans, and 
repeatedly over time pounded and carved and etched into those walls you know meaning making symbols makes no sense uh, and le left no evidence other than the symbols themselves um and we're trampling right over a bunch of dead bodies of homo naledi in features buried in the ground and the same goes with you know what is clearly an artifact i mean whether it is made or not is another issue, but it's an mm -hmm. alien thing inside of that feature. And anyone who looks at those images can see that. I don't know what to say about that. There's no other rock. Right, absolutely. And, you yeah. know, the fact that it is in the hand of the... Look, close to. It may or may not be. To. We're working on close it. We're to. working on okay. it, by the way. <laughs> um, we will one day know whether it is in the hand of that but it is very very close if not in the hand. right right which you know just another nail in a proverbial coffin if you ask me but um you know when we talked about the engravings there have been a lot of questions on and i've talked about this of course as you know with uh genevieve von petziger mm. and which has been a wonderful experience but what do you one of the questions that comes up constantly is why hasn't it been dated yet? And I think obviously the answer is more testing needs to be done and it will be done. But what's your answer right now? So let me let me let me start with some ironic sort of answers Absolutely. to that. I'll, I'll, I'll use irony, then I'll go to sort of more serious <laughs> answers to that question. And I'd be interested to hear Genevieve, who is a fantastic scientist, answer this, but I wonder what percentage of engravings that we have in the entire record have ever been dated. Mm. And I would suspect that it is in the, at most couple of hundred, most likely dozens. It is very difficult. The ability to date even get at dates, and we are not sure with these methods, which are all very new, to absolutely date mm -hmm. these things is brand new and requires extraordinary context. And it is a little disingenuous for people to just throw that out, particularly people who are sitting on um, thousands of pages of peer-reviewed literature published on rock engravings and rock art that they haven't dated themselves. Mm -hmm. um, that's a fact. It's, it, you know, Rock art is hard to date. Yeah. Uh, and so just to throw that out like it's a litmus test, when we have accepted contextual dating for decades, if not hundreds of years, is is I, I'd start there. However, adding to that, um, it's not easy. Any dating of these, they're on a wall, remember, is going to be destructive. <laughs> We felt that it was more important to tell the world they existed and then assemble what is going to be, I hope, in fact, I know one of the most remarkable teams ever assembled to address just that problem. Mm -hmm. You remember, think of my position in this. Think of our team's position in this. We have been tasked with both understanding and an analyzing what may be the first time in all of history that human beings have recognized meaning making symbols that potentially have been done by a non-human species. That is a heavy load to bear. And a big part of that has also got to be we also are tasked, therefore, with conserving and preserving them. Mm -hmm. And to just willy-nilly go in and apply in the infancy of this field a methods that may be extremely damaging to these and may influence how they are interpreted as we apply also the modern imaging and the next state of the art of imaging. Um, and, and believe me that I'm engaging with some of the finest imagers in the world. You know, luckily being with National Geographic, I happen to have access to a few. <laughs> and, and in ways in this extraordinarily difficult context, 
to make sure that we record, document, and analyze non-destructively before we destructively sample. I don't think right at the second, other than their existence, a date is critically important. And let me explain why. And I know that sounds funny, but our field has a fascination with dates that is actually mm -hmm. unhealthy. It is completely unhealthy. What is the time range of Homo naledi, Seth? You probably know that species almost as well as any other commentator in the world. 230,000 to 240,000 years ago? Around that? Um, no, that's not. No? Oh. No. No. That is the dates we have published for a context of a limited number of oh, individuals. Correct. Yeah, correct. Did the species live afterwards? Possibly. We, we don't know. Almost certainly. I mean, yeah, right. right. We're not... We are, I, this I can tell you, that that site is not document. I will, I will say this almost as a scientific fact. It is not documenting an origin event and an extinction event. Right, right. It's not doing that. So if we dated these and they came out as 110,000 years, mm -hmm. would that exclude Naledi? No, not in my if mind. If they came out at 50,000 years, would it exclude Naledi? I would... Yeah, you know, I'd say people would probably be more critical, but probably not. But, they, but for no other reason than the preconception we had prior to 2013, right. when we right. didn't know Naledi existed. <laughs> exactly. The idea of, like you mentioned earlier, of human exceptionalism, that only we could have done these things and that only we are capable of such fantastic creations is holding us back from, I think getting the idea of our true place in the world. And I think showing that Homo naledi and of course other, you know, Neanderthals and other species, well, you know, debatable if Neanderthals are another species on who you ask, but, um, you know, showing that they were capable of these things and especially a small brained hominin like Homo naledi really just kind of upends our ideas on what makes a special uh, uh and because we're not and that's exactly. a simple answer i mean you know it, the irony that that effectively we're saying that a small brain species can't have a culture and we have demonstrated now conclusively that chimpanzees and gorillas have cultures mm -hmm. cetaceans have cultures birds have cultures yeah and do you think that Homo naledi is logarithmically closer to us than any of those examples I just gave? Absolutely. Yeah. Why wouldn't they have a culture? Exactly. And so, you know, I will say that if I were formulating a hypothesis right now, based on the evidence I see emerging, I will suspect that we will find much younger Homo naledi. I don't, I don't know that for sure, but... I do think if you go back and read what we have published from the original papers, go back and read the way we came up with those dates. We explain it in great detail on all the papers that deal with the dates. There are other dates. There are younger dates. Mm -hmm. I can wow. tell you we found Homo naledi or what looks like it in older deposits now. But, but there are published younger dates, much younger dates. Yeah. We chose not to use those for a variety of both sound scientific, geological, and geological re reasons, and also because Homo naledi was so homogeneous, it seemed difficult that they existed over a very, very great deal of time. Well, I think we have to say that perhaps we need to begin to look at those hypotheses again uh, as evidence emerges, and so we are. And it's a process and it's not one that's easy and it's not one, you know, I was having a conversation with John Hawks and some others recently, mm -hmm. you know, there are, and, and this is going back to where we started this about the idea of, you know, what is the right way to peer review, you know, how much, how many scientific papers in our field, because of the nature of, of archaeology and paleoanthropology and because it was a field hampered by very poor evidentiary levels until relatively recently, um, you know, scraps and 
and right contextual here. scratch. How many papers from 30 years, 40 years, 50 years ago are right? Absolutely 100% correct. You know, not many. Mm -hmm. And they went through that same peer re review process, whatever this mythical form of that that you're talking about. So I, right, I just right. be cautious. Science evolves on new evidence and it builds evidence. And there's, there isn't necessarily one right way of doing things. You know, if we were scientists 150 years ago, we would actually be announcing these at conferences and symposia first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then writing a book about it. Um, you know, that would be the way you know, the science of Darwin was done. Right. And, and so, so, you know, I think we should be flexible and gentle. I am a big believer in the peer review process, but it has immense flaws and it is being overwhelmed by the foundational sort of neoliberal change in universities. It's made publish or perish in the idea that, you know, you as a young scientist are going to be expected to have exceed the average publication rate of your colleagues at whatever university you end up with. You know, your your two point three uh, papers per year kind of thing is ridiculous, <laughs> and peer review can't. You know, I am telling you here, and it's it's common knowledge, and it's we answer this in answering some of the critics, uh, but. You know, we were in a tier, a top tier journal for eight months and they could not come to a decision. Right, right. That's broken. Absolutely. Yeah. With this. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I was in October um, for, well, it's not for Halloween in the States, but it lines up with it. I'm hosting a symposium with Augustine Fuentes and a few others on human burial. And I came up with the idea about, ironically, a year ago. ironically, <laughs> yeah, I came up with the idea about a year ago and professor Fuentes was like, okay, that's great, but you need to wait. You need to hold on because there's going to be some great news that you are going to want to talk about. And so I'm like, okay, well, we'll hold on. And he had to keep pushing it off. And it was interesting to me. He's like, well, there's issues with the paper, the journals, the publications. And it's just fascinating to me how stagnated it has become in getting the actual word out and I think that is so important and why you went the way you did because to me at least informing people and bringing them along on the journey is more important than being in say that most prestigious journal and you know I don't know your views on that exactly but I feel like getting the info out to the people in a way that they can actually understand it and have access is more important. You know, I, I struggle with this all the time, Seth. I, I have to be very cautious. I happen to be, you know, I know that people, my critics of mine will say that, oh, he, you know, he's a radical. He doesn't conform to the way he's doing this all in the, these other ways. I would probably guess I'm one of the most published living scientists in science and nature. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, okay. I'm certainly going to be in the top few. And mm -hmm. so I'm about as conventional as you can get. <laughs> if that <if> your measure <laughs> is, you know, how many papers you have in those journals. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of ironic that people would say, oh, he's un boy, I, I have conformed. Uh, it's in spades. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are serious problems with that. I understand the nature of those journals and I'll continue to publish because I know particularly young scientists want need that and want that and, and feel that's a necessary part of the career. And I don't not support them. I just say that there are parts of that system, you know, for us to wait six months to get the first reviews back is, is tough. And, Absolutely. and, 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 and what is happening at the pace in which our teams are working across these landscapes, big, giant, multidisciplinary teams, we were accumulating other evidence that was critical to the field. You know, in the interim, we find symbols, we find fire, we find, um, you know, we find large scale faunal samples, we find they're using space differently, we're finding other things at other sites. You've seen the 105 site, you know, we're continuing work. And all of that's now hinging on whether or not the idea that burials are out there. 
Right. Um, the reason I chose to announce the fire in the Carnegie lecture like I did was because just before that, a whole series of peer-reviewed papers had come out in South African Journal of Science that were basically saying, well, it can't stand up to this if there's no fire and there's no fire. And I don't want to see colleagues embarrassing themselves over stuff that's right in front of us. A five-year-old right. could identify those big chunks of charcoal. Absolutely. Hundreds of meters back in a cave, hundreds of meters back in a cave. They didn't walk there and unless they were, you know, carried. And mm. it's not a, and so, you know, we made a conscious decision to just tell the world it's there so that we don't end up in this situation of people, science being damaged. Because for every one of those peer-reviewed papers um, that are published, we're going to end up having to go back. And those people would then say, you didn't tell us. Okay, so, you know, we've talked a lot about the peer review process and why we're getting the papers out the way that they are and your views on open access. Now I want to talk a little bit more about Naledi itself and the discoveries. And I, you know, there's one thing that I'm really wondering and that you've alluded to slightly talking about the 105 site and a few other things. And of course, the fact that Rising Star is not an extinction event or a origin story. Of course, I assume you're looking for other uh, localities, but what are you, what are you looking for that would indicate, besides morphologies, that it is Homo naledi versus something else? So that's that's really tough because until very very recently, the last year. And we haven't had evidence for Naledi culture other than their existence and their morphology. Mm -hmm. So until that point, the uh, search has been about finding pieces of them. I mean, and part of that was looking in those temporal periods where we knew that they were in that region. And, you know, some of that's, you know, there are there are things published from that period. Um, if you if you go back to Gladysville, you know, Lucinda Backwell right. and I right. and others published uh, a a human hair from a hyena <laughs> coprolite dating to like 240,000 years. And what's the odd? That's an Aledi hair. Uh, right. know, it just shows the biases that all of us carried with us because we knew only humans existed uh, at that point. So maybe we already found them there. Um, and, and looking in temporal periods around, looking very carefully at the morphology of other small brained hominids that hominins that have been assigned to things like Homo erectus based on their time. And the idea that there was only one species at any one time once encephalization began. Think of those like the small-brained erectus from East Africa, or the Alorgus ile hominins, or the hominins that, I mean, out of places like Kenya now. Um, you know, could some of those be Naledi or Naledi-like? You mm -hmm. know, and remember, you they're likely what you're going to see is not going to be an exact replica of this group of them or this population or this, this, you know, uh, um, lineage of them, whatever it turns out to be. And so, uh, so yes, of course we were looking in that. Now we're in the process of looking at, at, at Naledi culture, but that is, I mean, literally the work that we're doing is going to see, uh, this team go from 150 plus scientists to 300 scientists probably over wow. the next year. And, and we're, you know, we already were one of the largest science projects in the world and we'll be again, bigger now. And that work is yet to be done, but, you know, we have to now understand that uh, it is almost certainly that, you know, it always was, I think, but it's it, it, again disingenuous when people say, oh, you haven't found tools with Naledi, therefore they don't use tools when the landscape is littered with tools in that temporal period. Right, right. Um, it, it, the hypothesis should be, unless you find large brain hominids, it's Naledi. That's the way science works, at least <laughs> that's where I came from. And yeah. you got to prove there are large brain hominids there. And I think you're very much aware that the dating of large brain hominids in in in, su in Southern Africa, but in sub-equatorial Africa and even in sub-Saharan Africa is woefully terrible. Yeah. You know, there, there, there are a tiny number of hominids you would swear 
our date. And, and the irony, of course, is we now have to go back and look at all of these situations. Because if Naledi, if there is even the remotest possibility that Naledi is bearing its dead, whether you like the hypothesis and the evidence that we will be continuing to add to and responding to, and we're grateful, by the way, for all of the ideas of ways of improving this work. But if there's the remotest possibility that Naledi is bearing its dead, where does that sort of behavior begin? You can't say it's not in the Australopithecine, which have equal sized brains mm -hmm. to it. And what if some of the hominins, which have been literally picked up off the surface, were actually from burials? Mm -hmm. And they've been dated by the surfaces you're picking them up from, but they were intrusive yeah. into them because you didn't consider burials. How many paleoanthropology digs in the past 50 years have excavated a hominin? with the idea that it might have been a cultural event. Practically none, I would assume. Probably none, other than maybe Neanderthals. And yeah. even then, probably none, because all well, the Neanderthals were dug up before that. So, <laughs> you know, it, it is, it's, it's practically zero. We have done what I think is a shamefully terrible thing, which I've only just recently come to realize, and I was part of. Mm -hmm. We have made the null one, hypothesis. One, one, one How many of uh, that? Sorry, our field has approached the excavation and recovery of hominids with the null hypothesis that their accumulation is natural. So the null hypothesis for any early hominin or primitive hominin or anything really prior to homo sapiens is natural. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to get rid of that. I think it's been incredibly harmful to our field or at least potentially harmful to our field because it is a fact that people who dig up dinosaur bones and non-hominin vertebrate, vertebrate uh, fossils dig them up in a different way. Mm -hmm. They are not dealing with it in the way that a forensic case would, that a that you would deal with a, a human situation. I believe that we should approach all hominin excavations, and this has emerged because of what we're facing, as the null hypothesis being it's a cultural situation mm -hmm. until proven otherwise. And the reason I say that is because we're going to see things that we are missing. And, you know, my, and this, this whole Naledi experience has been an exact example of that. When we went to this cave, we find a remote chamber full of bodies. Some of them beneath the ground, some of them in clusters beneath the ground. What did we do? We approached all of the geological interpretations, all the archaeology, all the way we excavated as if it were a natural process. And we missed things because of that. Hmm. We didn't see that the reason that 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 bones were out of place and that there were vertical femurs and things like that. Right. There appeared to be movement was because these were bodies in a hole in the ground that were collapsing. We invented all of these natural processes that we could not observe. Mm -hmm. Read about the famous drains that we talk about in the face <laughs> of the thing. They don't exist, yeah. but we invented them to explain that movement. We, I, I used to preach to those teams. I, I, and you ask anyone who was on those original teams, I would say, once we realized that we were going to hypothesize that these were deliberate body disposal, the repeated disposal of the dead, I said, but it's not burial. Right, right. Do not use the term burial. You would have heard me say that to you. Yeah. Do not use the term burial. We're not saying that. In doing so, we miss burials. Right. And in doing so, we blinded ourselves to things like those carvings on the wall behind mm -hmm. you. You know, people mm -hmm. don't see them if it's not there. We didn't see fire because I spent so much time and others telling people how hard fire was to see. And 
Whereas if the null hypothesis had been what it would be, imagine this. Now, let me give you a, 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 another scenario. Our team in 2013 excavated in front of the world a deep, dark chamber full of Homo sapiens bodies, only Homo sapiens bodies, and little scatters of them and dense layers of them all across a floor in a deep, dark chamber 120 meters back into a cave. Firstly, what would we have done? The first thing, we would have called the police. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We would have had to. Absolutely, yeah. Because the assumption, the no hypothesis, is that, Seth, when you walk out your door today, and I presume there's some kind of hedge or garden somewhere in the vicinity of your front door, either across the road or whatever, <laughs> and you see a human tibia <laughs> sticking out of it, is your first null hypothesis that it's a natural uh, occurrence? No, no. No, it's not. No. And therefore, the events that unfold after that are going to be a very, very different process. Right. And so as I think we have to transition as a field, mm -hmm. I think we have to transition to a field that chimpanzees and gorillas have culture. Yeah. These are closer to us. Than chimpanzees and gorillas <laughs> a great deal yeah it's incredible they had culture and we should approach the null hypothesis as that and i bet you we find a lot more then then we start going well was the was the first family three 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 but is that a burial site again mm -hmm. i'll bet you we didn't collect the evidence that could refute or accept that hypothesis Right. Because we dug it like a paleontological site. Was the Dakika child, the one little baby thing found on the entire surface of that region in Ethiopia, is a curled up baby in a fetal position. Mm -hmm. Where are all the baby fetal saber-toothed cats and antelope babies and that just that one? Yeah. Why is there a Lucy skeleton? Why is there a Takana boy? You know... Maybe if we change the way we ask that question, we at least won't miss. I'm not saying these are all cultural by any means. Please don't let right, anyone right. misquote me on that. What I'm saying <laughs> is we'll do better science. We will mm -hmm. pick up things we miss. It, you know, and I'm a person who's lived my career with this, with the, you know, the tong bird of prey hypothesis. And, you know, right, now that's right. an entire field of study of primate, uh, primate uh, avian interactions. Until then, it wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. seeing, seeing calculus on teeth, where we had been wiping that calculus off to take dental impressions to understand what they ate when there was food in the calculus. And Sadiba, right. that's why that Sadiba Nature paper was published. And, you know, all of these things are lessons in just that, that we are, we have so animalized in a human mm -hmm. exceptionalist term, ancient hominins that we have removed culture, their culture from our observational window. And I think we need to bring it back. If there is the remotest chance that what we're saying about Naledi is correct, then there is no excuse from this moment forward. Absolutely. And, you know, I think besides changing or adding to our understanding of just human evolution i think the naledi finds really have the opportunity to change how the science is done completely and to wrap up you know i just want to ask you along these lines what do you think rising star will do for the field in the next hundred years I think a, a couple of things. I think it will um, it will be seen as a moment where we had to re envision how we approach paleoanthropology. That we have to go back and look at sites where we have animalized this collection and had the null hypothesis natural, and ask really if it was. You know, we will we go back and ask why aren't there carnivore gnawed remains in the hundreds of hominins at Cirquefontaine? Yet almost every animal is is chewed. Um, why is the stories that we tell about places like Swartkrons about 
the one or two that have clear carnivore marks and not the hundreds that don't. And yet every other animal does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's true at Malapa. And so I think that it's very much what we were talking about. I think it will for if if we can remove the null hypothesis of of every hominin occurrence is a natural one and we move that to cultural, I think that will be an enormous contribution. I also think we're at a moment, and, and this isn't just Rising Star, that we've suddenly understood that these fossils are not rare. That we, and it took this moment, I believe our teams have contributed significantly to this, to change the eyesight of exploration and discovery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To understand that we need to believe they're there and then go and find them that that stymie that the idea of making them the rarest sought after objects was a little bit like what de beers did to diamonds they weren't rare at all right it right. just as long as you control the market that is the mm -hmm. permits and tell people where they can and can't work through the grant systems and you don't breed enough young explorers and let people get in the field yeah they're going to be rare it's a self-fulfilling prophecy naledi the work going on in Indonesia, the work going on now in East Africa by another generation, all of this across the planet. Look at what we're finding in Europe with Neanderthals because those blinkers are off. And, and, and look what you're finding in the Americas. You have to believe in exploration and you have to follow it and you have to do it and you have to support it. And grant agencies like National Geographic and others have to be behind explorers. Uh, the, the, the funders don't have to know that you're going. You've already made a discovery before they fund mm -hmm. you to go discover in a place where other people haven't looked. I've just come back from Gabon, you know, and I'm working with people like Tracy Kivel and others. You know, there there are fossils there in the tropics, in the rainforests, and you know those fossils should have been found, but we you couldn't get grants to work there because everyone knew they weren't there. Right, I've heard so many times. No fossils in the tropics. They disintegrate too quickly. Don't bother it's looking. It's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are karstic caves there. Surprise. Mm -hmm. Across the whole, the Congo, all the way into West Africa. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, we've got we've got to build. You've heard me say this a hundred times. I believe it. And I know it to be true. This is the greatest age of exploration. Mm -hmm. We are tying technology with the ability of young people and old people and everyone to hold the entire human and planetary knowledge in a device in your hand, no matter where you are. And you can phone a friend in every square inch of this planet for the first time in all of history yeah. and inquire about what's around you. We can see the world in a different way. We can get to the world in a way that's been unprecedented in all of human history this is the greatest age of exploration and now we add the molecular world <laughs> and oh yeah that's where i'll end what do i think naledi is going to contribute the investigation of culture true variance in biology within a species and the understanding that we can do the kind of things that we thought were impossible in the fossil record a decade ago. And watch this space on biomolecules, DNA, proteins, and whatever else is on the way. Well, everyone, you heard it straight from Professor Lee Berger. You're going to want to watch the Homo Naledi space for some molecular news. And, you know, it's... it's and there is the Netflix amazing. show. And Are you going to come out before got, it comes out? Yes, this will be out before the Netflix show. I want it to come out kind of near the date so we can show everyone what we're talking about. And I know you haven't seen it, but Lee, it is stunning. It really, I think, shows... I I'm glad it really it was. A, I there. almost died. I yeah. almost died. Of course, it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was. It's about as close to death as I've ever been. And we, John Hawks, and I also have uh, this book, Cave of Bones. Yes, yes, coming it out, is... and that's available in all good bookstores. Yes, it is a wonderful <laughs> read. If I can get the camera to focus in on it, um, I was 
lucky enough to be sent a early copy. Thank you very much for having that uh, set up. And, you know, this, like you said, and I think, like you always say, never stop ex exploring. You know, there, never, there's just never stop always, exploring. there's always more out there. That's it. All right, Professor. I think that was an amazing time. And I think we will end it here. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate it. And we will see you next time. Absolutely. I, there's going to be plenty of new discoveries coming. All right, guys. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. And we will see you on the next episode. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>